Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and superficial image consultant. Fifteen years ago, the world was shaken by an act of unprecedented horror and tragedy. And yet, in the face of an event which seemed to shake the foundations of all that was good and true in the world, out of the ashes there arose a new solidarity, a resolve and unity that can only emerge when mankind is truly tested. For only through courage, vigilance, and perseverance can we prevent a movie like Glitter from ever happening again. What? What did you think I was talking about? Believe it or not, there was a reason for that questionably tasteful introduction. Because not only was Glitter a remarkable critical and commercial flop, not only did it contribute to its star Mariah Carey having a breakdown, and to this day she refuses to hear it mentioned in her presence, it has the ignominious distinction of having released its soundtrack on September 11th, 2001, a fact which Carey attempted to use as justification for the movie's horrid box office. Which just goes to show that you can't cover up one disaster with an exponentially larger one. Especially when it's this noxious. Hold your nose and close your eyes, because we're about to examine the case of Glitter. In the prologue, we're introduced to young Billy Frank, who spends her days watching her mother Lillian performing in a smoky jazz club and nursing her through bouts of I could have been a contender self-pity. Lillian, for her part, sings and smokes and hits Billy's waspy dad up for money. What do you want to bet that in spite of all that, little Billy idolizes her mother and wants to be just like her when she grows up? Oh, sweet Lucifer, she sounds just like your average 12-year-old kid. Sin number one on this heavy-handed opening. Billy's backstory reaches Dickensian levels of laying it on thick. The alternately inspiring and problematic mother, the distant dad, the performing with mom on stage, which completely fails to convince me that Billy has any extraordinary talent or desire to perform. Even before the house burns down, it's all a bit much. Yes, it turns out that Lillian's habit of passing out drunk with a lit cigarette in her hands inevitably has tragic consequences. Although nobody is killed, Billy is taken away by social services and sent to a foster home. And look, Billy even has a kitty with her! Don't you pity the poor foster care girl and her kitty? Have the feels, damn you! Billy makes friends with a token black girl and a token Latina girl, and we skip ahead via photo montage to... 1983? Right, before we go any further, we have to address sin number two, the arbitrary setting. I have absolutely no idea why you would set this movie in the early 80s, and it's clear that nobody else involved with the movie does either. There is the occasional New Wave song on the soundtrack, but apart from that, nothing about the setting says 80s. In fact, Carrie's music and fashion sense seem to hail more from the 90s, which makes sense because that's when she had her big international breakthrough. I know you're a fly DJ and everything. Nowhere in the script does the period come into play. In fact, this story could take place any time in the past 40 years and it wouldn't make any difference. The now grown-up Billy and her token friends are now dancers in a club where everyone dresses like the furniture in Graceland's Jungle Room. They are approached by sleazy music industry type Timothy Walker, who is looking for backup singers for the absurdly named Silk. With a Y. You know what, right now we're actually doing our own thing, so... Thank you, but I'm a little bit busy. Broke bitch! <laughs> the broke bitch! You know, you know what? You really want to sing back up for that freak? Hell yeah! Oh, come on, Billy. Even Effie White managed to swallow her ego enough to do that much. And sure enough, after some undignified begging from token buddies, the girls are in the recording studio with Silk, who is a pretty terrible singer because, of course, nobody can outshine Mariah in this movie. So, Timothy. Wait, what? Can I talk to you? Did parts of the scene get redacted by the FBI? This is just one example of how messy the editing is. There's all these random speed shifts and transitions and other nonsense. Moulin Rouge, a favorite guilty pleasure of mine, played crazy with the camera work as well, but it did it in a way that made sense. The scenes that were supposed to be frenetic and chaotic featured all the wild and rapid edits, while the quieter, more emotional scenes are done in a more subdued manner. 
Glitter, by comparison, is what you get when an amateur is working with their new editing software and wants to try out all the tools. Here's another example. Notice how everything slows down and the background gets all blurry? If you know your musical films, you're probably already recalling the famous scene in West Side Story where Tony and Maria see each other for the first time. In that film, the effect highlighted the instant intense attraction between the main characters. Here, it's just a pointless affectation. Timothy decides to pull a singin' in the rain and dub Billy's voice for Silk. Somehow this works, even when they're singing live and Billy is obviously not doubling Silk's part, and as a result, the song they've recorded gets a lot of attention. This is Silk. Boy, this don't sound like Silk. She must have put some hours in with a vocal coach, man. Crash. Crash. Now, there are a lot of things I could complain about when it comes to Mariah Carey's presence in this movie. She's no actor. Her character has all the dimension of a paper doll. She has so many pity-me moments that you expect some third-rate celebrity to come on screen and explain how you can sponsor her for just the price of a cup of coffee a day. But you know what really, really bothers me about Billy Frank? How much screen time is devoted to telling us what a fabulous talent she is? It seems like we can't go ten minutes without someone praising her to here and back, or simply standing in awe over the sheer magnificence of her voice. Okay. You, know, you have an amazing gift, and you gotta use it. You have got a beautiful voice. You can't let Timothy use the best of you. I, I meet singers all the time, but I ain't ever met anybody like you. You, you really got something special. Oh my god, your voice. It gets old. A DJ named Dice, yes, really, gets wise to Billy being used as Silk's voice double and hits her with a, no, really, you deserve better than this because you're a super special snowflake routine. To prove it, he sets up an impromptu open mic session. Dude, hand that thing to Lin-Manuel Miranda. He could freestyle an entire musical about the random trilby hat guy in the background. Nobody catches on that Billy is helping Silk pull a Millie Vanilli? Okay then. Dice offers to produce for Billy, promising that if he does, she'll be selling out Madison Square Garden in about 70 minutes of screen time. To do that, he needs to convince Timothy to release Billy and her token friends from their contract, which Timothy is obviously reluctant to do since it would put an end to his whole Perdita X knit gambit. Still, he agrees to let the girls go for the low, low price of $100,000. Billy records a single with Dice, and before you know it, record label execs are falling over themselves to make her a star. Great show. Thank you. How are you doing? Excellent. Are you signed yet, Billy? Signed like a record contract thing? It's a very tight race, but I think we may have found the single stupidest line in this entire movie. This is, of course, the rapid climb to success part of the movie, which is followed by the developing romance part. Can I ask a question? Uh Uh-huh. Why'd you get me a rose? Because it's the tritest expression of affection I could come up with. This is followed inevitably by the success isn't all it's cracked up to be part. We ask ourselves, is she white? Is she black? We don't know. She's exotic. I want to see more of her breasts. And the Billy searches in vain for her long-lost mother part. It's an imperfect system, Miss Frank. Records are destroyed, people disappear. Do you get the impression that you've seen this plot before? Several times? Good, because sin number five is the paint-by-numbers script. If I were using the cliché counter from the burlesque case, that thing would be burying the needle. Although I will admit, this may be the first movie in history where the male love interest shows off his sensitive artistic side by playing the marimba. So Billy and Dice's relationship progresses amid a cavalcade of truly horrid dialogue. Look, what I wanted to say is that you're you're different. You didn't have to say that because we just slept together, you know. That's that is that's that's so romantic. Which culminates with Dice asking her to move in in the most passive-aggressive way possible. I mean, like you know. 
half your clothes are here anyway, and space really isn't a problem, and I just think it... Now, we're supposed to believe this is all very sweet, but the more we see of Dice and Billy together, the more things feel... a little bit off. I called cut! I called cut! Can you not see these guys are all over her? She looks amazing. Yeah. If you're like Titsy the porn star. Porn star? Look, I'm just saying that, you know, this is this not right. So we gotta redo the shoot. We gotta, you know, lose the, um... Get your girls and go to the car now. What? Get your girls and go to the car. Don't make me make a scene, Billy. I didn't want to actually write a song with you if you were, um, you know, properly dressed. What is that supposed to mean? What it means is, look at everything here. Everything is hanging out. Big red flag! So yes, in number six for making your leading man a controlling, borderline, emotionally abusive douche basket. It doesn't help this heavy-handed, oh, M.O., the music industry is so exploitative message you're trying to sell when you put it in the mouth of a character who is trying to dictate to Billy how she should behave, or who gets all passive-aggressive about her success even as he graciously gives her permission to work with other producers. But Dice's assholery exists on other levels as well. It turns out Timothy Walker has wandered back into the plot and gets all, bitch, where's my money, on Dice. Dice, being the charming person that he is, isn't having any of that. Are you hungry? Nah. You got food in your crib? Always. Well, when you run out, come see me. Because this was a bullshit deal and you know it. So, that's two sins in a row for Dice. Why exactly can't he pay off Timothy? Presumably, as Billy's producer, he's seeing at least some of the profits of her rise to stardom, and if he's not, but his self-reliance or toxic machismo or whatever won't allow him to ask for money, shouldn't that be detailed in the script? The way it's written, Dice's motivation is basically, I don't want to, so there, which is badly defined conflict and also makes Dice look rather stupid, especially as Timothy gets more threatening. Dice's resentment of Billy causes an increasing strain on their relationship and is not helped by the fact that he doesn't get along with the token backup singers. Yes. Okay, and this is better. This is definitely better than We have to go. Hurry up. Come on. Fine, I'll lose the spot because I look better with that anyway. It shows more what I got, and that's what Fine. I want to show. Sure. Fine. Okay, you know, as on. much as I dislike Dice, I may have to side with him on this one. These two are freaking annoying. Equally bad is Billy's PR team. Gina wants you to wear that red sequin thing with the fringe pants, but I don't know. I'd rather that thing with the thing. The pink know, thing with the boa. The pink thing with the boa. Yes. The pink thing with the boa. Ugh, it's like the network executives from The Simpsons were hit by the blue fairy. All right then, sin number eight on the crappy comic relief characters. Anyway, the Billy Dice tensions escalate when he goes all possessive jealous boyfriend after a random pop star starts complimenting Billy and talking about doing a collaboration with her. You. What an incredible voice. Oh, I, you know, maybe we could write something together. He didn't mean it like that, okay? So stop it. But matters don't reach ahead until Timothy shows up at their apartment and tells Billy about the money Dice owes him. Now, I don't want to hurt you. But I will. You know, this character is actively threatening Billy with violence, and I still like him more than Dice. At least he's honest about his intentions, instead of trying to hide behind some I'm only thinking of what's best for you bullshit. Upon hearing Timothy threatened Billy, Dice does what any self-proclaimed alpha male would do and goes to beat Timothy up, promptly getting arrested as a result. And who says there's never a cop around when you need them? Billy is forced to ditch an appearance on a copyright-friendly Saturday Night Live show to bail Dice out, which turns out to be the last straw. So what do you want me to do? You want me to get down on my hands and knees and thank you for everything, Billy? Because you know what? At the end of the day, it is... At the end of the day, it is all about you, right? You're wow, pot-calling the demon's heart black much, Dice? Mercifully, none of the attempted guilt-tripping has any effect, and Billy walks out, taking the cat with her. Is that the same cat from the opening scene? That thing must be ancient by now. Never mind. It's time for the sad montage. Dude, these two have been on screen together all of 30 seconds, and I already like the relationship better than the one I'm supposed to be rooting for. Also, Dice's prophecy has come true, and Billy is scheduled to play Madison Square Garden, so really breaking up with him is the best thing she's done. 
Despite this, the movie tries to convince us that Billy's success is a hollow one, as she writes sad poetry while in another part of town, Dice writes sad music. Oh, movie, you had better not be implying what I think you're implying. No. Just no. Even if I believed these characters had any sort of compatibility emotionally or artistically, there is no way I am going to believe that they are so in sync that they can magically write the exact same song like they've got some sort of psychic composing link. Nothing that has happened in this movie has established that this is a world where that sort of thing can ever happen. Shame on you for suggesting it. Billy pitches a prima donna fit during concert rehearsals for no discernible reason and goes back to Dice's apartment, also for no discernible reason. There, she finds their magical special song and also a ticket to her concert that night. Oh, isn't that sweet? He actually does love her! Or, you know, maybe he's stalking her. Billy could hang around until Dice comes home to talk things over with him, of course, but instead she just leaves a cryptic sign that she broke into his home and messed with his stuff so maybe they deserve each other. But don't worry, I'm sure no tragic turn of events will ever prevent them from... Uh, never mind then. Also note that this is the last time we'll see Timothy for the rest of the movie, so presumably he gets off scot-free. Which would be sad, but honestly I'm just upset that I can't buy the man a drink. Billy hears the news of Dice's death just as she arrives for the concert and is badly shaken as a result. But you know what they say. The show must go on. At this point, I'm just recalling movies I like a lot more as a defense mechanism now. Anyway, it's not long before Billy decides she can't go on with business as usual. Everybody out there, don't ever take anybody for granted. Because you never know when you might lose them. Oh, don't you dare, movie. Don't you even think of showing us an entire film of this emotionally manipulative, possessive, selfish, egotistical fuckstick and then say that the problem was Billy just didn't appreciate him enough. That is exactly the narrative an abusive asshole like that would want. One that absolves him of all guilt for his actions and places it on the shoulders of his victim because he is entitled to whatever position he deems fit to hold in her life. None of the supposedly sentimental gestures that follow make up for that. Not the fact that the special psychic song is so opposition-damned magical that the band knows the music for it even though they've never seen it before and this is literally the first time it's ever been sung in public. Not the fact that Dice tried to make up for his behavior by sending flowers to Billy's room before he died, along with a note arranging a tearful reunion with Billy's now sober mother, because all he did was say, oh, by the way, social services called, they found your mom, and aren't I just such a great guy for passing the message along to you? And certainly not the tearful reunion itself, which apparently involved Billy's limo driver taking her directly from New York to Maryland on a moment's notice. Seriously, movie, fuck that Shit! Oh, sweet Lucifer. This comes close to being the worst movie I've ever passed judgment on, and I do not use that term lightly. Glitter has absolutely no redeeming qualities about it. None. It's badly written, badly acted, badly edited, cliché-ridden, painfully stupid, musically forgettable, comedically inept, and focuses on a relationship that makes me sick to my three-and-a-half stomachs. It's not even worthwhile snark fodder. It just hurts. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell orders the following punishments. For the impossibly chaotic and disruptive camera work, we condemn the editing staff to be implanted with one of those thought interruption devices from Harrison Bergeron. 
For inflicting this mess upon an already troubled world, we condemn the producers to an eternity of watching from Justin to Kelly. Finally, to Billy Frank, well, honestly, she needs nothing so much as the number of a good abuse hotline. Seriously, honey, get help. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned, and thank Lucifer for that! Thing. What's with that streak of silver makeup that Billy has on her body in nearly every scene?